We'll see if some questions come in. Okay. No, there we go. We're already getting some questions. So good morning, everybody. We don't have any questions left over from last week. Um, we already got a question from Doug McComb this week. So we're going to hang on for a couple of minutes and see if we get any more questions. Doug, we will definitely get to yours. Yours will be the first up. And looks like Jamie Campbell is in. Good morning, Jamie. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. It's good to see you. Um, I'll do the questioning and you do the uh, the calling yep. if that would work for you. Yep. Okay. All right. Hugh, our first question is from Doug McComb. He says, ancient wise men lived in an age of much astrology. After all, that was what the heathen religions of the time were basically about. Worship of the sun, moon, stars, and the like. This worship went on in Babylon, Persia, Egypt, Greece, and just about everywhere else. I heard someone say that the wise men, the Magi talked about in Matthew 2 were in astrology. I've been taught that astrology is sinful. Please comment, is this true in all situations? And he, yeah. and he has a follow-up question to that. Well, it's a great question from Doug. And uh, I wrote on that, geez, some um, 35 years ago. And there's a little paper you can get uh, from the people at Reasons to Believe. And it's called... Uh, you know, astrology, science, or what. And I also have a paper, a very short paper on, um, uh, you know, were the wise men mentioned in Matthew astrologers. Now, uh, the term magi, uh, that's in the Greek. That's a transliteration of the Hebrew word for wise men. So we refer to them as wise men or magi. And we're also told in the book of Daniel that Daniel is the greatest of the wise men. And that is three Jewish compatriots also were part of the wise men of Babylon. It also tells us in uh, uh, the uh, you know, book of Daniel that these wise men were trained in all the sciences of the East. And that would include the so-called science of astrology. And so the wise men that we see in the book of Matthew would have been familiar with astrology. Uh, does that mean that they were astrologers? I don't think they were astrologers any more than Daniel uh, or, you know, his three friends were astrologers. They were aware of it. Uh, they knew the basis of it. Uh, they knew uh, as Jews, and as, as you know, being familiar with the Old Testament, they knew that astrology was a forbidden enterprise. I mean, astrology is basically looking at the stars to, to discern what's going to happen in the future. And we're told in the Bible not to look at the stars uh, for wisdom or insight or what's going to happen in the future. We're to go to God. And clearly Daniel and his three friends did that. And what we see of the Magi in the New Testament is that uh, they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the one that uh, Daniel had prophesied. And, you know, what I write in uh, my comment on the Christmas star and the wise men is that uh, these wise men only had one book of the Bible. They had the book of Daniel. Daniel is the only book in the Bible where part of it is written in Aramaic, which has been very familiar uh, to people living in that part of the world. Uh, about half of it's in Hebrew and half of it is in Aramaic. And uh, you know, since Daniel was the greatest of the wise men, they would have been familiar with the writings of Daniel. And what's interesting about Daniel, it's the only Old Testament text that predicts the timing of the coming of the Messiah. And hence, that's why the Magi were looking for a sign. And I think they were looking for a sign from God, not just in what's going on in the heavens, but everywhere. Uh, but as I've written, uh, they saw this new star that had not been there before. And they said, well, this is roughly in the time frame. Uh, that Daniel, the greatest of the wise men, predicted. It's in chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. So they said, let's go to Jerusalem and to see uh, if we can find uh, this uh, coming uh, Messiah that has been predicted. Uh, but what we notice is they did not know the location. They knew the time because Daniel predicted the time. It's Micah that predicted the location. 
So they got instructions from the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem about where to go uh, to find uh, this promised Messiah. Uh, so there's nothing in the Bible that explicitly states that the wise men were astrologers. It simply says that they were wise men from the East, being wise men from the East, they would have been familiar with the writings of the greatest of the wise men that ever lived, namely Daniel. And uh, evidently they were very impressed, uh, not only with Daniel, but with what he wrote and were obedient to what he wrote. I think the wise men were followers of God. Uh, they were seeking God, they were seeking the Messiah. Uh, and I think too, when they came to Jerusalem, they realized there's more revelation than just as one book we got. I would expect that uh, having visited uh, you know, Joseph and Mary and have laid the gifts before Jesus, having been uh, in communication uh, with the scholars in Jerusalem, I believe that they actually wound up reading uh, the rest of the Old Testament. And I believe they became followers of Jesus Christ. And if it wasn't for the gifts that these uh, magi had brought, these wise men had brought, then Jesus would not have survived. Now, there, there's a follow-up. I'm happy to take a follow-up. Yeah, the, the follow-up to that from <clears throat> that was, how could the star that the Magi sought out and found in Matthew 2.10 legitimately signify anything from afar about the coming arrival of the Messiah? Is there a prophecy about the star? There is no prophecy about the star. There's nothing in the book of Daniel that says that God would send a sign of the coming. However, being students of the book of Daniel, they would have been aware of the prophecy that after a passage of 483 years, after the signing of a decree uh, between uh, the Persian empire and uh, the Jewish exiles, the Messiah would come. And it actually talks about what would happen in the life of the Messiah. He would come, uh, he would minister, he would be killed, uh, and then he would come back in the future. That's what's interesting about Daniel actually predicts that there'll be two comings of the Messiah, predicts that he would be killed uh, during his first coming, and actually gives a date uh, for when this Messiah would come. Now, what makes it challenging is there were actually uh, three decrees from the Persian kings to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. So it's unclear exactly which decree we should use to count the 483 years. With hindsight, we can figure it out. But in the context of the Magi, they would say, well, it's got to be one of these three decrees. Uh, but the three decrees all happen within a span of a few years of one another. So they knew the date of the coming of the Messiah to within, say, plus or minus three years. And therefore, I think they're observant. Hey, this is such a significant event. Uh, what Daniel talks about what this Messiah will do actually refers to this Messiah as God himself, so this is such a significant event, maybe there will be some kind of indication that will help us to determine that this is the time. So I think they were looking everywhere, not just in astronomy, they were looking everywhere uh, for some kind of indication, but they knew that the appearance of a new star in the sky was an extremely rare event. And so when they saw this new star, they said, maybe that's it. Let's go to Jerusalem and find out. And what it tells us, see, they, they had some doubts whether this star was really an indication. And what you see in the book of Matthew is when they were on their way from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, after they got the information that Bethlehem is a place where the Messiah uh, would be born, on their way to Bethlehem, the star reappeared. And what does the text tell us? They were overjoyed at seeing the second appearance of the star. And so that gave them the reassurance that basically took away their doubts and saying, this is it. We really are going to find the Messiah. So I think just understanding uh, that like all of us, they had their doubts, uh, but God reassured them and said, hey, this is it. Great. Thank you. Yuvan from the Netherlands says, the gospel speaks about impure spirits. Are they fallen angels? Aren't Satan and his dominion fallen angels still in heaven? Yeah, good question. Uh, and yeah, the impure spirits are reference to fallen angels. The Bible tells us that they're righteous angels. 
and fallen angels, uh, that about a third of the angelic realm joined Satan in rebelling against God. And Satan actually thought he could become equal with God. And uh, it's quite clear, no, uh, that's not the case. But yeah, about a third of the angels are in rebellion. We don't know exactly how many angels there are. We do have a lower limit because it tells us in the book of Revelation uh, that there's at least a myriad of a myriad. A myriad is 10,000. So it tells us at a minimum, there's 100 million angels, but there could be a whole lot more. Uh, there could be billions, there could be trillions. We don't know. Uh, we do know that they're intelligent beings. We know that they're spiritual beings. We also know that they're not constrained by the space-time dimensions of the universe like we human beings are. But we also know that uh, they have a limitation relative to us human beings. We human beings experience the grace of God. The angels do not, neither the fallen angels nor the righteous angels. But both the fallen angels and the righteous angels have been granted the capacity to watch the operation of the grace of God working uh, within us human beings. And uh, are, they, are they around and where do they dwell? Uh, well, uh, we are told in the New Testament that uh, these fallen angels and the righteous angels too can come into our realm. It tells us in Hebrews 13, verse 2, that many of us have entertained the righteous angels unawares. And we do see written evidence of this in the book of Acts. Uh, and they can appear in any physical form uh, that they choose temporarily. So uh, they can take on the form of a human being. They can take on the form of a flying saucer. Uh, I've written a book making the point that what we see in the UFO phenomena that proves to be real indeed is a manifestation uh, of these fallen angels uh, or demons. And uh, they're out to deceive us. They're out to harm us. Uh, but what's also clear in the Bible is that, yes, these fallen angels have invaded our realm. Uh, have they all invaded our realm? We don't know. I mean, they're... I mean, they're in heaven, uh, they're here, they can come and go. Unlike us humans, we humans are constrained to the physical universe. We're constrained by the laws of physics. Uh, we're constrained by the space-time dimensions of the universe. Evidently, the angels have the capacity uh, to exist totally outside of the realm of the universe, uh, but they have been granted the power to come into a realm or go back to their realm. So exactly where they're all living right now, we don't know, uh, but I believe that uh, some are existing uh, in a realm beyond the universe and some are actually here. Uh, what we do know about both the righteous angels and the fallen angels, they evidently do not spend their time permanently in our realm. They can come into a realm, but it's really not their, their particular home. It's a place they visit. But yeah, we've been visited. And uh, with respect to the fallen angels, however, they're around us, but they need permission to invade our lives. If we don't grant them permission, uh, they can't do us uh, any harm. And once a person gives their life to Jesus Christ, they cannot be taken over by a demon. They can still be oppressed, uh, but they can't be possessed. But yeah, you can read the New Testament the Gospels, and there you encounter people who are actually possessed by these fallen spirits. And what that's all about is one of these fallen angels actually fighting over the control of your body. I mean, your spirit has basically been granted control over your physical body. Uh, but if you grant the demons permission, uh, they can fight with you to control your body. And so people can be possessed by demons. And uh, you know where you have a lot of occult involvement this is where you see a lot of demonic oppression and possession. And I'll just tell you, I have personally seen people who have been possessed by demons. And uh, there's lots of physical evidence uh, verifying that what you're seeing there is not just a human manifestation. I've also seen people delivered uh, from demonic uh, possession. Uh, it's rare here in the United States in the 21st century. Uh, having visited the Soviet Union twice uh, when it was being run by the Soviet communists, I got to see a lot of examples. 
of uh, demonic oppression and demonic possession. It actually addressed scientists in audiences and auditoriums, where at least a fifth of the individuals attending uh, were clearly demon possessed. So it's rare here. Uh, and the reason why it's rare is we have far fewer members of our population seriously pursuing the occult. That's how we grant the demons permission. And so, and I've written a book on UFOs, making the point that people who have real encounters uh, with these UFO beings, it's only individuals who've granted permission. And when they take the permission away uh, by closing the door uh, to occult involvement, that's the end of their UFO encounters. Thank you. It's uh, 1045. Did you want to start your uh, webinar? Yeah, let me do that. Uh, we, I think we got a fun lesson for today. So uh, let me get started with that. Let me begin by opening our time in prayer. Father in heaven, I uh, just want to thank you, Father, that uh, you've given us uh, the opportunity to live our life here on earth, to be a recipient of your grace. Thank you, Lord, that we have that privilege and that as a result, a day will come uh, when we will be leading and instructing and teaching uh, the righteous angels. So, Father, I pray that uh, you would help all of us not only to receive your grace, but to really benefit from that. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you saw fit uh, to redeem us from our sin and evil, to set us free step by step uh, from sin and evil. So this day, Father, I pray that you would open up our spirit to receive more of your truth, life, and love, and enable us also to encourage others uh, to likewise follow our example in receiving more of your life, love, and truth. So Father, give us clarity of thinking, give us submission before you as uh, we study what you've revealed to us in your two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, like what we've been doing for the past several weeks, uh, we've been doing a series here on dual revelation, how God reveals himself through both the book of nature and the book of scripture. And I've been picking, because uh, what we've been doing before we dump, jump into our scriptural uh, teaching, it's actually looking at a new scientific discovery that gives us more evidence for this dual revelation theology and more evidence that literally every day uh, God is giving us more evidence for his existence and his attributes through what he's revealing in the book of nature. And so I've actually found a discovery published literally just two days ago uh, in the scientific literature uh, that uh, I think gives a great example of the two books doctrine we see, see taught in the Bible, how God has faithfully and truthfully revealed himself through both the book of nature and the book of scripture. As I mentioned last week, this doctrine of dual revelation is under greater attack than it's ever been before. It's always been under attack from people outside the church, but now it's under great attack from people within the church, even the most theologically conservative uh, branches uh, of the Christian community. And we had reasons to believe are right in the middle of this uh, big fight fact uh, I'll be speaking at the theological conferences in the near future uh, as a defender of this uh, two books doctrine. I never in my life dreamed as a Christian that I'd actually be put in this position of trying to defend what I believe to be one of the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. Article two of the Belgic Confession, God reveals himself through two books. So with that, let me share a screen. Uh, better go over to my other computer here. Here we go. Okay, uh, this is my first uh, slide here. And just what simply want to remind you, I do take questions on Facebook and Twitter, as do all the staff scholars of Reasons to Believe. You can ask Fuzz Rana questions on his Facebook and Twitter, as well as Ken Samples or Jeff Swearink. And a Reasons to Believe does maintain a 24 seven YouTube channel that you can subscribe to for free. Uh, we also have Instagram. I'm personally not on Instagram. My staff won't let me. They say, Hugh, you've got enough to do. Uh, but if you go to Reasons Done, by the way, you got a brand new website. We're still having issues with a search engine on our website, uh, but I think you'll really see 
that our new website has some remarkable improvements and it's going to be a lot more attractive for people visiting us uh, for the uh, first time. And uh, this is the URL we're going to need to go into our web meeting where we get to uh, have an uh, open microphone and open uh, video discussion with one another. And I want to begin by uh, bringing forward to you uh, a recent thing produced by the Barna uh, Foundation. And uh, this is uh, their studies of what they call the rise of the nuns. Now, for all of you who are joining us from overseas, uh, they have actually written about the rise of the nuns here in the United States. That's the figure you see here. But they've also commented this is being seen in nations all over the world, but it's being predominantly seen in uh, nations, uh, the first world nation, the more technically advanced nations, uh, the wealthier nations, mainly uh, nations uh, like, say, the United Kingdom or Australia, New Zealand, uh, you know, Canada, uh, the United States. Uh, this is where you see this, quote, rise of the nuns. And they define nuns as people who will identify themselves as a not theists. Uh, they're either agnostics uh, or they're atheists, uh, or uh, they just say, we don't think uh, belief in God is at all important. So they may be agnostic on the, whether or not God exists, but God literally plays no role in their life. They don't attend church. They're not involved in any kind of faith community. Uh, they don't read the Bible. They see religion as simply having no value in their lives. And in 1900, it, with respect to the U.S. adult population, the number of people in that category was only 2%. And uh, you can see that uh, by 1990, uh, it had risen to a little under 5%. And then in 2009, uh, it had jumped up uh, to 17%, and then in 2018 to 26%, and in 2020, the last year, they made statistics 35%. Now, the Barna people also just, uh, broke this up according to ages, and what they discovered is amongst teenagers, it's double the number that you see amongst adults uh, that are past the age of uh, 24, so literally double uh, the number. So basically they're saying uh, this st these statistics show us that the rise of the nuns is increasing exponentially and particularly more rapidly among the younger members of the uh, population. Okay, what is interesting is that, uh, you know, we live at a time when fewer than 10%, some people would say it's less than 2% of the world's population has had close contact with wild mammals and wild birds that have never been abused uh, by human beings. And what's interesting about this graph I showed you of the rise of the nuns, it's basically reflecting what we see going on in the last hundred years, the rise of urbanization and technology. Namely, it's only in cities where people have had little or no contact with wild birds and wild mammals that have not been abused by human beings do we see the rise of the nuns. And in my 45 years of ministry, I've seen that. Uh, when I've gone overseas and have ministered in, in places that are rural as opposed to being industrial uh, or urban, uh, it's rare to find someone who would identify themselves as a nun. Uh, they're all theists. And you know, when I say all, at least 99% would identify themselves as believing in a personal God. So it's the rise of urbanization that I believe where people have been cut off from the book of nature. I've, I've shared with audiences that in some respects, in spite of our high level of technology education, we in the 21st century are more ignorant about the book of nature than people lived 4,000 years ago. Because now we see an increasing percentage. But what I find interesting, you look at that exponential curve I showed you, it's the same curve you get for the rise of urbanization and technology. And so you see, for example, in the uh, book of uh, Job, 
is uh, let me let my computer to catch up here. Job 12, verse 7. Ask the beast. This is a reference to uh, the uh, wild uh, mammals, and it says they will teach you, or the birds of the sky, and they will tell you. And the new discovery I want to share with you has to do uh, with a study on uh, donkeys and horses. And it makes note of the fact, in fact, I just kind of looked at the Bible and realized donkeys are referred to 93 times in the Bible. Horses are referred to over 50 times in the Bible. So they get a lot of attention. And in the book of Job in particular, you've got paragraphs on how God designed the donkey and the horse to serve and please us human beings. And what you see in these biblical passages, particularly the Old Testament, is how valuable donkeys and horses are to human beings. And so they had such a high value uh, that when people found a wild horse or a wild donkey, uh, they would spend time domesticating uh, that creature because of its high monetary value. In fact, what you see throughout the Old Testament is that the value or the wealth of individuals was often measured by how many donkeys or horses they had. And so, for example, in the book of Judges, it talks about one of the wealthier judges uh, who had you know, 30 uh, sons uh, and how each of them had their own donkey. So evidently, uh, just like it's rare uh, for someone to have an expensive sports car that they give to their son, back in those days, it was considered rare to be wealthy enough that you could actually buy a donkey uh, for your son or incredibly to buy a donkey for all your children. Uh, so, but you see this repeated in the Old Testament just how valuable donkeys and horses were. And this continues to this day. And this caught the attention of several American ecologists and biologists. They said they noted, for example, that feral donkeys and feral horses are rare in the Western world. Um, these creatures to this day are so valuable uh, that when you go out into the wilderness, you don't see uh, horses and donkeys. Uh, wild horses and donkeys. But consequently, what happened here in the United States, this research team said, let's do an experiment. Uh, let's actually introduce uh, horses and donkeys into the wild parts of America and see what happens. And that was the basis of the research. And they were stunned by what they discovered. And so, for example, uh, with the donkey, we see in Job 39. The whole paragraph is devoted uh, to the donkey. And uh, this is what it says. Who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied its ropes? I gave it the wasteland as its home, the salt flats as its habitat. It laughs at the commotion in the town. It does not hear the driver's shout. It ranges a hill for its pasture and searches for any green thing. And as I mentioned, there are 93 different Bible passages. This is just one Bible passage. 93 different Bible passages where it's a verse or two or a whole paragraph like this that mentions a donkey. And you, know, you can do this yourself, get out a concordance, actually look up all these texts. But what it basically tells us is that uh, the donkey uh, can plow your fields. Uh, it is able to carry a lot of weight. It's a very strong animal. And therefore, you can use it as uh, the equivalent of a truck, uh, where you can load it up with a lot of goods, and uh, therefore use it to transport goods. Um, and you can actually ride it. And uh, the fact that we see the donkey mentioned so frequently in the Old Testament as an animal that people would ride uh, tells us that humans indeed had to have an average height. That's a lot less than we have today. I mean, for example, the average Dutchman uh, has a height of six foot one. Uh, they're the tallest people on the planet today. And uh, they would have difficulty rising a donkey because their feet would drag on the ground. Uh, but this, the fact that the donkey was widely used as a human transportation animal uh, back in the Old Testament tells us that likely humans indeed 
or not as tall. But we got a lot of evidence uh, that the human population today has an average height that's at least a half foot uh, taller than what it was 2,000 years ago. We know, for example, that the average height of a Roman soldier uh, at the time of Christ was about five feet. And so, I mean, they were obviously recruiting the most physically fit people for the Roman army, and yet their average height was about five feet. And therefore, riding a donkey would be uh, fine for them. Uh, their feet would not drag on the ground. And uh, the Bible actually tells us a lot of things about donkeys, uh, how when they bond to a human being, they can become very loyal to that human being, and how donkeys are designed to really keep humans from danger. And so they're very sure-footed, so it's a great animal to take. I mean, for example, we don't take horses down the Grand Canyon. Uh, they, you use donkeys to go down the Grand Canyon. Why? Because the donkey is very sensitive to risk and is highly motivated uh, for protecting the human that's on its back. And so where the trail is treacherous and where there's dangers lurking, uh, where you've got uh, venomous snakes that could be a problem, you want to be riding a donkey. The donkey is going to be highly motivated to keep you uh, from danger. And uh, so, uh, and it also tells us uh, that the donkey is an easy animal to care for. That what we see in the Bible is if you lose your donkey, don't worry about it. It can take care of itself. And uh, you know, if, uh, so you lose your donkey, the donkey is able to go out into the wilds, uh, get the water it needs, get the food that it needs. Uh, it can take care of itself. Uh, and if three months later you find your donkey, your donkey is going to immediately rebond with you and uh, be domesticated. Very different from the horse. When a horse goes feral, it stays feral, but a donkey can easily switch uh, from being domesticated to being feral, to being domesticated, to being feral. So that's why it says, don't worry if you lose your donkey, it's gonna take care of itself. Don't worry about having to tame it again when you meet it. Uh, when it sees you again, it'll immediately rebond uh, with you. That's the donkey. Trans transitions very easily from domestication to living in the wild to being domesticated again, very wary of danger, and will do everything it can to help its owner avoid uh, risks. And then we got the horse. The horse is typically a bigger animal, just like with donkeys coming all sizes, a horse is coming even more sizes. In fact, in the neighborhood in which I live here, uh, you know, I live in San Dimas, California, and it's a horse town. Uh, all the uh, streets are uh, zoned for horse travel. And so uh, they'll have dirt paths instead of sidewalks. And uh, we have horses of all different sizes. In fact, not far from us, there's a lady uh, who has a horse that's about the size of a Great Dane. And she takes it for walks every day up and down our streets. And so it's kind of a pet. She doesn't ride it because the horse is so small. But I also know that there's a horse uh, not too far from us that's big enough that a 300 pound man can easily ride it. So we have horses of all different sizes, but typically the horses uh, are such a size and height uh, that it can carry any human being plus all their gear. It's a very strong animal and your feet will not drag on the ground. Even if you're seven feet tall, your feet are not gonna uh, drag on the ground. On the other hand, it's not like a camel where you're so far above the ground and the back has a shape that's not easy to stay stable on. And when you're riding a camel, uh, the big challenge is to stay on the camel. And you have to have very special saddles and you have to have a very well-trained and tame camel in order to safely ride it. And the camel gets startled and uh, you wind up falling off. You're gonna injure yourself. Whereas falling off a horse typically is not gonna lead uh, to a serious injury. And the thing about horses, well, let me just show you what Job says about horses. It says, do you give the horse its strength uh, or uh, close its neck uh, with a flowing mane? Do you make it leap like a locust, striking terror with its proud snorting? It paws fiercely, rejoicing in its strength and charges into the fray. Uh, you're not familiar with the term, it means it charges into a fight or a battle. It laughs of fear. 
It's afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword. The quiver rattles against its side, along with a flashing spear and lance. In frenzy excitement, it eats up the ground. It cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. At the blast of the trumpet, it snorts. Aha! It catches the scent of battle from afar, the shout of commanders, and the battle cry. In other words, it's telling us here uh, that the horse is radically different from uh, the donkey and the way it relates to its human beings. And let me just give you a little bit of backstory here. You know, as I've read the evolutionary biological literature, it often cites uh, the horse and the donkey as evidence for naturalistic common descent, that all life comes from a universal common ancestor, a bacterium that naturalistically evolved. And it says, look at the donkey, look at the horse. They're so similar to one another physically. In fact, you can mate a donkey with a horse and get a mule. So this is evidence for naturalistic evolution. The problem here is all they've been comparing are the physical features of the donkey and the horse. They've not been comparing uh, the nephesh features. These are both nephesh animals, a Hebrew word for a soulish animal that God has endowed with mind, will, and emotions, and a capacity and desire uh, to relate to human beings and to serve and please human beings. But these two animals, as similar as they look to one another physically, are radically different in the way they relate to us human beings. Uh, the donkey is highly motivated uh, to uh, highly motivated uh, to keep us away from danger. What we see in this text in the book of Job, and by the way, there are 59, uh, 58 other Bible passages on the horse in addition to this one in Job 39. But they talk about how the horse is a very strong animal. And it is an amazing creature. You know, given its weight and size, it's incredibly strong. As it tells us here in this text, it can uh, carry loads, it can uh, transport us, but it's also able to leap like a locust. And so it has a capacity uh, to, you know, do amazing things physically, leap over barriers, something the donkey is not able to do. Yeah, it can do all this. But unlike the donkey, it loves danger, it loves risk, and actually enjoys going into incredibly uh, dangerous situations. And it's the one animal uh, that humans have used to be able to go into battle. As it tells us here, it seems like the horse even enjoys taking us into risky situations. And I personally have had uh, some, you know, my dad was a cowboy when he was a teenager in Alberta. Uh, and his dad that he lost when he was only five years of age was a cavalryman in the World War I. Uh, but I've heard stories about my grandfather. Uh, he actually had a tea with a king and queen twice uh, because of his bravery in the war. And his job was to take a horse and go behind the German lines and spy on what they're doing and bring back information uh, to uh, the uh, generals and colonels uh, that were with the Canadian and the British armies. That was his role. And uh, four times he made forays behind uh, German lines. Uh, and he described how on one occasion, his horse actually saved his life. Uh, and that's one thing about horses. They'll literally lay down their life to save the life of its human owner. And uh, so they'll take you into very risky situations, uh, but they're also highly motivated to do what they can to make sure you survive that risky situation. So it's not afraid of the sword. It's not afraid of bullets. It's not afraid of exploding shells uh, going all the way around it. It seems to have no fear for its own safety. Uh, it's highly motivated to fulfill and serve uh, the human that it is uh, bonded to. Anyway, let me get back to this uh, uh, discovery that's just been published. What they discovered is that when they released donkeys and horses uh, into the Sonoran Desert, that's the desert around Arizona uh, here in the United States. And uh, for decades, uh, the Sonoran Desert has had no wild donkeys and no wild horses. But as a result of a scientific uh, uh, endeavor, uh, they actually released horses and donkeys 
into the Sonoran Desert and watch what they would do. Now, the Sonoran Desert is a dry place. Horses in particular need a lot of water. If any of you have ever had a horse, you notice just how much they drink because like us, they can perspire. I mean, one reason why the horse is such a great animal, transportation animal for us human beings, is that it has a very effective perspiration system, just like we humans. And therefore we can take our horses everywhere that we can survive. You know, we have this wonderful perspiration system. So as long as we drink plenty of water, we can keep our bodies cool. And the horses like human beings are clothing tolerant. And so when it's really cold, uh, you can put blankets and clothing over the horse uh, to keep it warm. And hence we've been able to use horses in all different climate uh, and uh, weather conditions, uh, just by the fact that uh, it has so much in common uh, with us. But consequently, in the Sonoran Desert, where it's hot and dry, it needs a lot of water. And what they discovered is these wild donkeys and horses have a very sensitive uh, sense of smell. And they can actually, and by the way, I've been in desert places. And I, you can actually smell water because when rain falls on a desert, uh, it reacts uh, with the dry dust and it actually releases an odor that you can tell. I grew up in coastal British Columbia and when it rained, we never smelled anything. Uh, but because of how rare it rain is in the Sonoran Desert, when rain falls, an odor is released. And also when rain settles into the soil and drops down several meters, uh, if you've got a very sensitive smell, you can actually detect that water. And what they discovered is both donkeys and horses are able to detect the odor uh, in a dry desert that could be meters below the ground. And when they do, this is what they do. In fact, uh, this is a photo that was taken by Eric Lundgren, uh, one of the three uh, scientists that published this uh, paper. And uh, basically he was able to photograph uh, in the Sonoran Desert, a donkey digging a hole in search for water. And this is one where they looked at a feral horse and notice the horse does the same thing. Uh, that they can kind of smell a, a tiny scent of water and they begin digging to get down to that water. And how deep will they dig? They'll dig as deep as two meters. And so in their search for water, uh, they will dig that deep and to get the water they need uh, to drink. And as you can see in this photo, you actually got two horses, uh, both uh, digging in the dirt in search uh, for that uh, water. And uh, what this does, is it increases the water availability, not just for horses and donkeys, but for all the wildlife that lives there. And so uh, what they discovered is you've got these wild donkeys and wild horses uh, digging these shallow wells. Well, actually as much as two meters deep. And what happens is other animals will take advantage of this. And so deer, for example, uh, don't have the capability of digging like donkeys and horses can dig. Uh, but they'll find these uh, shallow wells and they'll take advantage of them uh, to get the water that they need. So this is actually a photo showing mule deer in the Sonoran Desert. And here you got a mother uh, with her fawn, uh, both getting the water they need, uh, thanks to the feral uh, donkeys and horses uh, that were there. And uh, what they discovered is it's not just deer, Bobcats, jays, mice, rats, cattle, passerines, uh, insects, all kinds of uh, animal life in the Sonoran Desert will take advantage of these shallow wells uh, that the uh, horses and the donkeys have dug. And consequently, they're seeing the population levels of wildlife going up in the Sonoran Desert because now there's more water available to them. And moreover, it's actually having an impact on the desert itself. Because what happens is that, uh, you know, some of these wells will dry up and then erosion takes place and they begin to fill in. Uh, but these three scientists uh, searched over and then, uh, you know, here you can see where they've outlined uh, an old um, shallow well 
that was dug by a horse, a feral horse. And what they notice is there's a tree starting to grow there. And so uh, you get uh, these abandoned, they call them abandoned equid wells, abandoned wells that have been dug by donkeys, wild donkeys and horses. And what will happen is small seeded, fast greeting, flood adapted trees uh, will germinate there and begin to grow. And uh, so, uh, yeah, there's certain pine trees, for example, uh, that are very well adapted uh, to being able to grow uh, in a flood adapted region. And the Sonoran Desert is a place where you might get one rainstorm per year and it'll actually flood the area. Uh, but we're only talking at two or three inches a year. And so you get this sudden rain. Well, what happens is these trees uh, that germinate in the places of these wells, uh, because the soil is loose and loose down to about two meters, they rapidly grow roots all the way down uh, to a two or three meter depth. And therefore they're able to pull that stored water there after uh, one uh, flood, a, a short-lived flood, and be able to use that to keep them going throughout the year. And consequently what happens, these trees begin to grow and thrive and they transpire uh, water vapor to the atmosphere. And when they transpire water vapor to the atmosphere, that actually changes the climate over the Sonoran Desert. And so they close their paper out saying that we could soon see a significant rise in rainfall in the Sonoran Desert, all because of these wild horses and uh, wild donkeys. So they close their paper off by saying, we need to seriously think about reintroducing wild donkeys and wild horses uh, into these dry, hot regions. And you see this throughout the Bible, uh, particularly with respect to the donkey, how well a donkey is able to survive and thrive in what is called the wastelands. The wastelands of Judea are basically hot, dry deserts. And it says that's the ideal habitat uh, for these wild donkeys. Uh, but thanks to these wild donkeys, it now becomes a much better habitat for all the other wildlife that is there and actually can have an impact over the course of a couple of decades on transforming the wastelands where now you've got more of these fast growing trees that are able to survive on just a few inches of rain uh, per year because of where they germinate and actually begin to increase the rainfall uh, over uh, that area. And basically makes the point that the Bible is made, that God uh, purposely and intentionally designed the horse and designed the donkey to be of service to us human beings, but not only to be of service to us human beings, but be a service of all life here on planet Earth. And yes, uh, we've domesticated these, we've taken them off the wildlands, but we need to seriously think about, hey, what can we do to improve the ecosystems of the world by reintroducing uh, feral donkeys and uh, feral horses. And maybe we can do that with other creatures as well. So I'm encouraged by this paper because it's actually showing us that, uh, hey, there's a lot more going on amongst the different life forms on planet Earth. We're living at a time where we see the greatest diversity of species on our planet that has ever existed in the entire history of the Earth. And each of these different species of life has been designed by our creator to serve and please us, to bless us, but to bless all life. Okay, where we left off last week in our study of a dual revelation is basically looking at the debate that's going on about is there really science content uh, in the Bible? And uh, we basically made the point uh, that a number of theologians today at uh, you know, very well-respected conservative seminaries are actually arguing that there's very little science in the Bible. And we think our science texts in the Bible really are not science texts. Uh, I will say this in their favor. They do recognize that the Bible speaks about the universe having a beginning. Uh, but many of them think that that's the limit of science content in the Bible. And as I mentioned last week, at least from my perspective of studying the Bible, uh, there are not just a few texts in the Bible, a verse here and there, there's actually entire chapters in the Bible that deal with the subject of creation and science. 
You say, what do these theologians think about these passages? Well, they think that I'm mistaken. They say, hey, Genesis 1 is not a text about creation. Uh, it is telling us a story, a story about God, a story about how God relates to us. It's talking about a heavenly creation, not an earthly creation. That's what the framework hypothesis people suggest, uh, that we need to look at these as not literal texts. Uh, they're basically parables or figures of speech. That's how they react. But from my perspective, and I don't think I'm alone. I mean, I, I've been able to cite in my writings, the Reformation scholars, people who lived at the time of the Reformation, three, four uh, hundred years ago, 500 years ago, looked at these same texts and recognized these are not just uh, myths or figures of speech or parables. They literally are speaking to us about actual events that happen in the history of the earth. And in particular, there's a big debate going on today. Uh, is what described in Genesis a chronology or is it just a random assembly of statements uh, that we shouldn't be taking uh, literally? At least from my perspective, and I'm gonna be teaching on this in the Paradoxes class soon, as we actually look at Genesis 1, you see this in Genesis 2. If you actually look at it in the original Hebrew uh, grammar and the language, we see it's going overboard to tell us that this is an actual chronology of events that took place. So yeah, uh, from our perspective, it reasons to believe these are creation texts. These are science texts. We cite this as evidence, what we call our moderate concordance position. Namely, that the Bible is not devoid of content in science and creation. On the other hand, it's not like what hard concordists say, that virtually every passage of the Bible is dealing with science and creation. I agree that the Bible is not a science textbook, but I also would hold the position that it does address issues that pertain to history, geography, and science. And when it does, it speaks plainly, literally, and we're to understand this. Uh, in that particular context. Just look at the way it's written. Uh, and yeah, admittedly, a lot of these texts are in the poetic books. Uh, we see them in Psalms and Job and Proverbs. But we also need to understand that unlike English poetry, Hebrew poetry, at least from the context of the Old Testament to Jews, was understood to be a powerful tool for communicating didactic truth. And you see, I mentioned Isaiah 40 and 51. These are the texts that speak most specifically about uh, God, the attributes of God. Isaiah 40 to 51, I bargained that we taught in this, the paradoxes class. We went through these uh, chapters in Isaiah, making the point that this is the one extended text of the Bible that gives us the most detail about the doctrine of the Trinity. I've often shared this with my Jewish friends, that the doctrine of the Trinity is predominantly an Old Testament teaching. Uh, it is addressed in the New Testament, uh, but it's addressed most extensively in the uh, New Testament or the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Isaiah. But I've got a friend, uh, the astronomer, uh, David Block. Uh, he's at Witzwater Sand University. And uh, he's looking forward to getting his vaccine so that he can come and spend time at our Reasons to Believe headquarters as one of our visiting scholars. And uh, David and I have, uh, we wrote a peer reviewed article uh, back in the 1990s together, uh, but he was raised as an Orthodox Jew and became a Christian. And one time I asked him, well, David, how did you become a Christian? He says, well, a big factor was reading all the Old Testament passages my rabbis told me not to read, that they were too difficult to understand. And particularly, it was his reading of the book of Isaiah that basically opened up a door for him. Hey, we really are looking at a triune God. And so and then we see passages in the New Testament. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, we have a big debate about the flood. In fact, I'm writing a book on the flood right now. And I think is what's significant is how much of the New Testament actually talks uh, about the, uh, the flood of Noah. And therefore, we need to look at the entire Bible as giving us insight. But notice this is only a few chapters of the Bible. Uh, we're not saying that the Bible is predominantly a textbook about science, geography, and history. 
uh, but clearly it does address these subjects. And when it does, it addresses them in a truthful way. And I found that theologians I've been debating who are very critical of the two books doctrine that we teach at Reasons to Believe, our concordance position that the book of nature actually agrees with the book of scripture, um, that, <clears throat> sorry, I lost my place, uh, but uh, let me just move on here. Um, and this is the problem. When I can't see people in the class, they can often remind me when I'm losing my place and get me back on track. So I'm looking forward to that time we can actually have in-person meetings again. But for all of you who've been joining us uh, through uh, uh, Zoom, we're going to continue that. It's always been a blessing to me, even before the pandemic, uh, just how much we've benefited from people living outside of California uh, participating with us in the class. So we're going to continue to uh, permit you to be involved. Uh, but I just find it helpful when I'm in front of actual human beings uh, that I learn from them as they learn from me. And so I'm looking forward to actually being able to see and engage you uh, as I teach. Um, but you know, one thing uh, that I've been sharing with my friends who are critical uh, of our uh, you know, two books doctrine is what we see in Romans uh, chapter one. And it says, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. So it's actually making a point that we can actually see the revelation of God uh, in uh, nature. However, my friends who are very critical of our concordance position will say, we're not denying that God uh, is revealed in nature. We think he is. We just think the revelation we see in nature is distinct from the revelation we see in the Bible. Uh, we don't see an overlap. On the other hand, that doesn't make sense to me in looking at the Bible from a mission perspective, as it wouldn't God use the book of nature uh, to encourage people to investigate the book of scripture, and wouldn't at least some overlap between what we see in the book of nature and the book of scripture be helpful in doing that. But Romans 1 makes it clear that God does, that science, the record of nature does reveal God and not just God, uh, but his personal attributes. We'll come back to this text in a little bit, but I want to introduce you to the Belgic Confession. And, uh, you know, one thing that has impressed me is that the creeds of the church are not inspired scripture, uh, but I've been impressed in reading church history uh, that just how careful uh, Christian scholars were in actually going through the Bible and pulling out the, what they claim to be the essentials. What are the critical things we must believe in order to be followers of Jesus Christ? And what is it that the Bible reveals with sufficient clarity where we shouldn't have any doubt that this indeed is what scripture is teaching? And let's actually put in the creeds those doctrines uh, that are clearly revealed that play a role uh, in enabling us and to come into relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, yeah, what I was going to share earlier, too, is my friends who are very anti-concordists nevertheless recognize that God does reveal himself through history, and that the, when the Bible talks about history, what it's talking about is literal truth. Uh, what I find difficult, though, is if the Bible is being truthful and literal, and what it reveals about history, both past history and future history, uh, and prophetic, uh, you know, and what I would call the prophecies of the Bible, how the Bible is loaded with hundreds of places where it predicts future historical events. And likewise, we see the Bible referring to geography. And uh, again, uh, my friends uh, who are very critical uh, as theologians of our concordance position at Reasons to Believe will recognize, yeah, the Bible is truthful when it talks about geography. So I find it ironic that they can see that the Bible is literal and truthful when it addresses history and geography, just not science. From my perspective, it's truthful about history and geography. I would anticipate it would also be truthful about science. In fact, it's hard to actually disengage geography from science and history from science. 
so much of science is dealing uh, with locality, uh, with geography, and uh, with uh, history. Well, let me uh, finish this up here. Matter of fact, I've gone 40 minutes. I didn't intend to go that long, uh, but let me at least introduce you to the Belgic Confession, and we'll pick this up next time. This is Article 2 of the Belgic Confession. So I find it significant uh, that, you know, one of the key cornerstone creedal statements of the Reformation, the Belgic Confession, along with the Westminster Confession. Uh, the Belgic Confession is a little shorter than the Westminster Confession, but both Westminster and Belgic are saying, let's actually expand upon the short creeds of the church and really look at the doctrines that are most critical in order for us to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And what impresses me about the Belgic Confession, it puts the statements of the two books doctrine very early in the confession. It's Article 2. It's not Article 18. It's Article 2. And it says here, we know him, namely God, by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, since that universe is before our eyes like a beautiful book in which all creatures, great and small, are as letters to make us ponder the invisible things of God. And then it continues and says, secondly, he makes, again referring to God, himself more clearly and fully known to us by his holy and divine word. And it basically derives this from Psalm 19. So next time I get together with you, uh, we're going to actually look at Psalm 19 and Romans 1 in a little more detail and just see how, and that's actually what the Belgic confessors did. They went to Psalm 19 particularly and secondarily to Romans 1 to craft this Belgic confession uh, that indeed God has revealed himself to everyone through the book of nature and how in Psalm 19 it refers to nature as an actual uh, book. Okay, we'll get to that next time and also begin to examine what is it about Psalm 19 that tells us how we should go about studying theology and how we should go about science and who should be doing that. So with that, let me uh, stop the share feature. And we'll take it back to Mark and Jamie and uh, we'll take questions until about uh, noon. And uh, then we'll go into our uh, web meeting. Thanks, Hugh. We have a question from Scott from Florida who says, I'm curious about how do we know when we're genuinely hearing the Holy Spirit versus our own thoughts? Great question. And uh, you know, having served as a pastor now for four decades, all the time I get people coming up to me saying, uh, I got this message from the Holy Spirit. And I can't tell you many times uh, men and women have come to me and said, the Holy Spirit told me uh, that this member of the office of sex is going to be my future wife. And it's like, okay, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, what confirmation do you have of that? How do you know it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you and not just your desires? In fact, the Bible tells us that we have to be cautious of interpreting our human desires as actual messages from God. And so how do you do that? Well, there's several ways. Number one, we can search the scriptures to see what we think is the Holy Spirit speaking to us consistent with what that Holy Spirit inspired human authors to write. And then we can actually communicate with God in prayer. So looking at scriptures, praying to see if you're actually discerning what God is revealing to you in scripture and in your dream, uh, or the vision that you had, uh, or just what God revealed to you in prayer, is this consistent? As it tells us in 1 John, we're to test the spirits to see where they're coming from. I mean, is it our spirit uh, that's getting in the way of God communicating to us? Are we actually hearing God's <laughs> spirit speak to us? Or are we being influenced uh, by the spirits uh, of the evil one? And so we're to test the spirits and to test them rigorously. Uh, and this is one reason why I think the command in Hebrews 10 is so significant, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves with one another, because I think another good check is, okay, 
What about the believers in your life that are spiritually mature that you trust? Are they able to confirm uh, that what you're discerning from the Holy Spirit uh, really is uh, from uh, the Holy Spirit? So get confirmation. Get confirmation from your uh, reading of the Bible and also uh, get confirmation from your prayer life and also uh, from uh, Christians within that you trust. And so, for example, I think it's good to actually say, okay, um, actually go to people and say, what do you think God is saying to me right now? Don't even give me any details. I mean, I've been just trying to discern what is God communicating to me? And so, uh, again, you know, just, just kind of lay that out. Don't give any details. What do you think God is telling me? Where do you think God may be rebuking me? Because often when God speaks to us, uh, he's actually trying to correct the path that we're on. And so going to people that you trust, uh, people who are spiritually mature in your life, who have been walking with the Lord for a long time, where do you think God is guiding me? Where do you think God is rebuking me? Where does he want to stop what I'm doing and change? Uh, is he opening a door in my life? And is he closing a door? And if you read the book of Acts, Notice how God would direct the Apostle Paul by closing doors and then opening up other doors. And so, again, uh, and experience. Uh, the, you know, the longer you walk with the Lord, I think the more uh, experience you'll have in the best way of hearing God's voice. And uh, I think, too, following Paul's example, where he would fast from sleep, uh, as you see uh, in his writings, there were times uh, where he would spend an entire night in prayer, uh, asking God questions, wrestling with God in prayer. I mean, you see that with Jacob. Jacob spent an entire night uh, wrestling with God. And we think of that, that passage in Genesis as Jacob physically wrestling with God. But if you actually look at that passage, it was a spiritual wrestling because he knew he was going to have to face his brother, his brother whom he had wronged. And he needed counsel from God and how to deal with his brother. And if you read that passage in Genesis, it's quite clear it would take an entire night of prayer with God to actually get the wisdom that he needed uh, to be able to deal with an incredible danger he faced with his brother coming towards him with 400 armed troops. And so likewise, when we face a crisis in our life, uh, just like sometimes it's valuable to have a day where you fast from food, Incidentally, we do that regularly at Reasons to Believe. Uh, in fact, I see that uh, Bob Stewart is part of our attendee list. I'll say thing about Bob. He's kind of serves as a pastor for our staff at Reasons to Believe. And he is the one that's been working with me to organize regular days of prayer and fasting uh, for the ministry of Reasons to Believe. But we need to be doing that personally. And uh, you know, whenever there's a spiritual crisis, this is a time. And you can fast from sleep, fast from food, uh, fast from video games, fast from texting. Hey, in the 21st century, there's lots of different ways uh, that you can fast. And you actually see that in the life of um, Daniel. Daniel found different ways of fasting. And the principle of fasting is you stop your regular life in order to focus on things that are really uh, most important in your life. That's the principle of the Sabbath. Stop your regular work in order to focus on the most important issues of life. Thank you. Chris Thompson from Anchorage asks, uh, my son had a terrible experience with fundamentalist pastors he lay labels evil. He's leaning towards Richard Rohr. Can you suggest an approach to soften him away from mysticism? Yeah, I don't know who Richard Rohr is. Maybe somebody can uh, uh, educate me on who uh, he is. Uh, but, yeah, I think we Christians do a lot of damage to one another. I mean, we're all sinners. And, uh, you know, we need to be especially sensitive to people in leadership because they can lead a lot of people astray. I mean, Paul tells us uh, that those of us who are leaders and teachers are going to be judged by a much higher standard because uh, of the damage we can do. And, hey, church history is filled with examples of church leaders uh, who, and keep in mind, pray for your church leaders, pray for your teachers. They are targets of the evil one. 
the evil one is trying to drag him down because he knows if he can drag them down, he can drag down a lot of people with him. So pray for your leaders, pray for your teachers, pray that they be spiritually protected. But yes, I recognize a lot of us have experienced damage from spiritual leaders. But I think we have to be careful not to let uh, the damage we've experienced from human sinners get between us and a morally perfect God. God is the only one who's morally perfect. He is the only one that's always good. And so we need to go to him. And hey, all of us have been damaged and attacked. Jesus warned us uh, that the attacks that would come against us would come from, quote, within the religious community, within the church. Uh, keep in mind, a lot of non-Christians regularly attend and participate in church. Uh, the evil one sends them there. Uh, you know, Satan and his demons know the best way to attack uh, the mission of Jesus Christ is to go after his followers uh, in their churches. So if you see insane things going on in the church, to me, that's an apologetic uh, piece of evidence uh, that God exists. I mean, I see the insanity of what's going on in the church and saying the only rational explanation for what I see happening in the Christian community is that it's a target of attack uh, by Satan and his emissaries. It's the only thing that makes sense, which is one reason I don't take personally the attacks that come upon me uh, from fellow believers. I know we're not dealing just with flesh and blood. And uh, you know we've been warned by that by both Peter and Paul uh, that we will come under attack and it's gonna be a supernatural attack. And so we shouldn't be uh, surprised that we're coming under these incredibly irrational attacks. It's the norm. We're not wrestling just with flesh and blood, but with spiritual powers, with evil beings. Uh, that's reality. And it happens even here in the United States. Thank you. Stephen Posta says, uh, because of the great distances between Earth and centaurs, current telescopes recognize even the brightest ones like Chiron as little more than merely a point of light. How then is it possible for astronomers to declare that Chiron has rings around it when the planetesimal itself is barely distinguishable? Yeah, well, often you can't see the ring uh, in visible light, uh, but you can see the dust signature in the infrared. And so astronomers are now aware that almost every major body in the solar system has a ring. We know that the Earth has a ring. And what we're talking about are dust particles that are in orbit about the Earth. We don't see them at visible wavelengths, uh, but at far infrared wavelengths, we do get a faint signature uh, of these uh, rings. I mean, with Saturn, you got a spectacular ring system. With the other planets, you got one that you don't notice unless you get really close to it uh, or unless you observe it at a broad range of uh, wavelengths. But we would expect this to be the case, just looking at the dynamics of our solar system. Matter of fact, we'd anticipate this would be the case of star systems everywhere in our galaxy, other galaxies. Uh, just the fact uh, that you've got bodies colliding with one another, and when they do, uh, you get uh, dust, and they don't even have to collide. They can just go nearby one another, and that's gonna pull off the volatiles, the gases and the liquids from that body. And so, uh, you know, space is not totally empty. There's particles there, there's dust there, and it will be subject to the dynamics. And what I find interesting is that these observations, matter of fact, I see that we have an astronomer here who's an expert in this, Karina Macau, and she actually gave a talk uh, several months ago in her class, actually talking about uh, these dust signatures. And so this is a, a big area of research uh, in astrophysics, particularly planetary astrophysics. Uh, and what I find interesting is our observations are consistent with what we'd anticipate just building theoretical models uh, based on uh, Newtonian mechanics and electromagnetic theories about what we should expect. We do see a match. Thank you. Tim Williams says, uh, if Noah's flood had been global, would we expect the Antarctic cores to start from that time because all the ice would have melted? Or would there be some other obvious disturbances in the ice cores? 
Yeah, very good point. And I've actually raised that in uh, my dialogues and debates with Christians who believe that the flood of Noah covered the entire globe. If it covered the entire globe, uh, we would see something in the ice cores. And uh, we see no evidence uh, because with the Antarctic ice cores and the Greenland ice cores in central and northern Greenland, they reliably show us what's been happening with the global climate uh, every single year, uh, or at least the climate that existed in that part of Antarctica and the Greenland. And so uh, the four Greenland ice cores and uh, the five Antarctic ice cores uh, that give us a record of at least the past 120,000 years of our Earth's climate history, in those records, we see zero evidence uh, for any kind of flood in that region. And I've cited that as evidence uh, that the flood of Noah could not have extended to Greenland and Antarctica. If it had, we would see evidence uh, in the ice core record. The ice core record will tell you uh, what kind of rainfall you're getting. Uh, it will tell you what the atmospheric composition is. We can actually measure the oxygen level and the carbon dioxide level. Because in each ice core, you've got little air pockets. And those air pockets will faithfully tell you uh, what was happening in the atmosphere uh, at that time. And uh, you'll be able to see how much ice was forming and not forming. It gives us a temperature record. So actually you're able to determine uh, the, the three oxygen isotopes actually reliably tell you the temperature that existed literally year by year uh, throughout the past 800,000 years. And more than that, we have sediment records. So if there was a flood, for example, off of New Zealand, the New Zealand uh, deep sediment records that go back more than 4 million years, they would show us evidence. And there again, we see no evidence uh, for Noah's flood. What's interesting, we see very concrete evidence of volcanic eruptions um, back throughout the past 100,000 years. Every volcanic, you know, even a relatively minor volcano, like what happened at Mount St. Helens, shows up uh, in the Antarctic and uh, the Greenland uh, ice core records. So even subtle events, like a relatively small volcanic eruption, uh, will show up, will leave a dust signature uh, with an isotope signature that tells us, hey, uh, this volcanic eruption uh, happened at this time. This is how intense it was. So... That to me is powerful evidence, scientific evidence that the flood of Noah was not global in extent. Uh, however, I've argued that you've got equally strong uh, biblical evidence. Second Peter two, verse five, the world of the ungodly was flooded. Doesn't say the whole world. It says the world of ungodly people was flooded. And there were no people living in Antarctica and Greenland at that time. And you also have second Peter three, six, the world of that time was flooded. So do you notice in Second Peter is that at every time it mentions the flood of Noah, it qualifies the Greek word cosmos, translated as world, with an adjective or a phrase, basically telling you we're not talking the entire planet. We're talking that part of the planet uh, where ungodly human beings lived and where the animals associated with those human beings uh, lived. Thank you. Susan Lambeau asks, have you read Misinterpreting Genesis? That's a book, book title, apparently. Misinterpreting Genesis, How the Creation Museum Misunderstands the Ancient Near Eastern Context of the Bible. Ben Stanhope makes a very convincing case that the biblical writers, and even up to first century AD and later, thought of the sky as having a metal firmament which held back waters. Yeah, Susan, I'm familiar with that book. And I'm, you know, this claim is being made repeatedly in the last uh, decade. This idea that ancient peoples uh, universally held as belief that the world was flat, there was a metal dome above the earth, there were holes in the dome from which water above the metal dome flowed through. That explains the rain. And on this inside surface of this metal dome, uh, we have the stars. And uh, my colleague, Fazal Rana, was at a conference of Bible scholars and, uh, you know, Near Eastern historians, uh, where a gentleman 
thoroughly refuted that uh, claim, basically saying, yes, uh, we do see that story coming out of Babylon, uh, but it was a minority of ancient Babylonians that held that view. The vast majority of people living in ancient Babylon rejected that interpretation, as did everywhere else in the world. So that what has happened is you've had people glom onto this uh, very minor position uh, held by people in the ancient world and try to make the idea this was universal and that the people who uh, were writing at the time of Moses uh, basically incorporated this into their theology and into the Bible. And I've written about this in my book, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, uh, where people actually claim uh, that, you know, Genesis and Job teaches uh, this flat earth idea with a metal vault over it. In fact, I've noticed that some modern translations actually translate the word expanse uh, in Genesis 1 as a vault, uh, basically conceding this idea that the ancients believed uh, in this metal dome uh, over a flat earth. And I've also written making the point that, you know, we need to avoid 21st century hubris, where we think we're the ones that are really educated. We know what's going on, and it's unique to us living in the area uh, arena or era of the scientific revolution. The truth is the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Chinese, Koreans, uh, Japanese, Babylonians, Sumerians, they were not as stupid about science as what many of these 21st century theologians teach. And uh, I responded to uh, John Walton's claims uh, that these ancient peoples did not care two bits about cosmology had no interest in science. And that's thoroughly refuted by any serious historian of uh, ancient cultures. They were deeply interested in science and uh, very much interested in cosmology and invested significant resources in the study of astronomy in particular. And they quickly figured out, for example, uh, that they could not measure the parallax of stars. Parallax is kind of a geometric uh, concept uh, where you got observers separated by significant distances looking at an object. And if the object is relatively nearby, uh, one observer will see it in a slightly different position than another observer. This is basic trigonometry. And uh, the ancients knew about trigonometry. They use it as a technique for measuring distances. Uh, but they were able, for example, to determine by parallax uh, that the moon, uh, they were able to approximately measure the distance of the moon and the distance of the sun. They were able to determine that the sun, for example, was a very much larger body than the earth, uh, but they were not able to measure the parallaxes of stars. And that told them that the stars had to be so distant uh, that naked eye observations, even from observers widely separated, uh, even when you take observations in the springtime and compare them with the fall time, uh, where you've got a difference of 186 million miles in the perspective, that uh, they could not see parallax there either, which told them that the stars had to be extremely distant. And the ancients actually figured out that the stars had to be bodies like the sun, uh, just so far away that they were not very bright. And so the ancients simply... Now, this idea that they were ignorant about science and didn't care about science, in my opinion, they're just like us, incredibly curious and willing to invest significant resources of time and money in the study of the basic sciences. And a uh, matter of fact, the ancient Egyptians that lived 3,000, 4,000 years ago personally invested way more in scientific research as a percentage of their national income than is the case in 21st century. In fact, at its peak, astronomical research was funded by the Egyptian empire at a level of 25% of the national income. I can tell you as an astronomer, uh, we're not funded even at 0.25%, let alone 25% of the, the gross national product uh, of our country. No nation is. And so the ancients actually invested more and scientific research than we did. And if you go to reasons.org, I have a paper there where I, I write about how 
modern day astronomers in the 21st century actually looked at the ancient Egyptian astronomical records in order to improve our models of stellar interiors. Basically, they looked at the ancient Egyptian uh, records of variable stars. And you know, they would observe these variable stars night after night, carefully timing uh, when the variations were happening. And uh, they were able to measure, for example, uh, the period of the variation of the eclipsing binary star Algol. That's the second brightest star in the constellation Perseus. They were able to measure the period uh, to better than four places of the decimal. And if we look at the period they measured, it's slightly different from the period we measure today, which tells us that the period changed. And the Egyptians had records going over enough years, literally over a thousand years, were able to see the change over that thousand years, the change that we see today, and basically use that to fine tune the interior physics of what's going on in the star Algol. That would not have been possible if the ancients had no care about science, no interest in science, no interest in cosmology, and had no idea of the configuration of the solar system. And then people say, then why do we have uh, this geocentric coming uh, idea coming about? Here's the truth of the matter. And I've written about this in my first book, The Fingerprint of God. The ancients long before Christ knew that the sun was the center of the solar system. They knew that the earth revolved around the solar system. They knew the approximate dimensions of the solar system. They knew that the earth was a sphere. This idea that the ancients believed in a flat earth, that is a myth. A few did, but the vast majority were well aware just from their uh, observations that the earth had to be a spherical body. In fact, hundreds of years before Christ, more than 600 years before Christ, uh, the earth was not only determined to be a sphere, they were actually able to measure the diameter of the earth and their measurement was accurate to within 1%. So they were able to determine uh, the actual size uh, of uh, the earth. You say then, why did they come up with this geocentric concept? They didn't have the mathematics of algebra. Without the mathematics of algebra, you can't predict the future positions of the planets uh, from a heliocentric perspective. And it was told me, it said, well, okay, we all know that the sun's the center of the solar system, but we can't make predictions from that perspective. But he came up with a mathematical tool based on plane geometry, uh, independent of algebra, where he was able to predict the future positions of the planets. And uh, he actually predict uh, when future eclipses will take place uh, from the perspective of putting everything at the center of the earth. And those of you who have studied uh, mathematics uh, beyond, uh, say, high school, realize, you know, in terms of trying to work out uh, dynamics, mechanics of any system, you can put the frame of reference wherever you want. You can put it at the center of the earth, the center of the moon, the center of the sun. Uh, you can actually make the math work from any of those positions. Without algebra, you're forced to doing it from a geocentric perspective. And just to set the record clear, Copernicus did not discover heliocentrism. What Copernicus did as a Polish astronomer, he got funding to visit the great libraries of uh, Italy. And when he visited those libraries, he discovered that people 2000 years before him had already determined uh, that the sun is the center of the solar system. The sun is a big body. So basically what he did is he revived heliocentrism. It was there in the ancient texts 25, 2600 uh, years ago. And uh, so that was a great contribution of Copernicus, actually going through the very few manuscripts that existed from that era in the great Italian libraries. Here we have um, one question that was uh, accidentally discharged earlier. And it was from Susan Lambeau who asked, uh, I know I brought this up before, but it's really important to me. Has any twin of our sun been found? I mean, there are trillions of stars. How can ours be unique? Well, that's a good question. And I've written about this extensively at uh, reasons.org. So people can go there and find about that. Um, 
For over 65 years, astronomers have been searching for a twin of the sun. Now you'll find lots of research papers that actually talk about uh, solar twins. But what the people meant by a real solar twin is a star sufficiently like the sun that it could be a possible candidate to have a planet orbiting it on which advanced life conceivably could exist. And in that 65 year search, astronomers have found many stars that are twins of one another, but they have yet to find a star that's a twin of our star, the sun. Now keep in mind, they've only been looking at our Milky Way galaxy. You say, why haven't they been looking in other galaxies? Because in other galaxies, we cannot measure the characteristics of the stars to sufficient precision to determine whether or not they're just a solar analog or an actual solar twin, or it could be a candidate to have a planet orbiting it in which advanced life exists. Now, I have a book coming out. It'll be out in uh, 2022, uh, Cosmic Interior Designs, uh, where I have a whole chapter devoted uh, to the search for a solar twin. And what is unique about uh, the sun as a twin? And I got a blog coming out in uh, May. I think the date is May 24th, somewhere towards the end of May, an article is coming out. It's about a 2,000 word article making the point that would really set the sun apart uh, from other stars that are a lot like the sun is that there's been a transfer of angular momentum from the sun to its rocky planets, and at the same time, a transfer of refractory elements from the sun to these rocky planets and explains why of all the planetary systems we've been able to discover. And now that list is getting close to 4,000 planetary systems uh, outside of our solar system. Well, it's over 3,000 um, that we don't see any planetary system uh, with big rocky planets, rich in refractory elements that are orbiting far away from their star. That's what's special about our solar system. We got this star that's deficient in refractory elements. And we also have a star uh, that has a unique lithium abundance. And that's a star where there's been significant transfer of angular momentum. And what that transfer of angular momentum does is actually explain why the rocky planets, Mercury, uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are orbiting so far away from their host star. If you look at other rocky planets that have been discovered, they're all orbiting really close to their host stars, much closer than Mercury orbits our star, the sun. That's because the star has not transferred significant angular momentum. The other thing we notice is that the total mass of our rocky planets in the solar system is much greater than the total mass of rocky planets in any other known planetary system. And uh, likewise, uh, their density is much higher. And uh, that's ironic because density goes down as you go away from a star, because the farther away you are from a star, uh, the more likely that planet will be able to hang on uh, to volatiles, to gases and liquids, because they don't suffer as much heat uh, from a star uh, to blast those away. And yet our solar system's rocky planets has a much higher average density than we see in other rocky planets. Anyway, that's all coming out in a book I'm bringing out in 2022, where I got two chapters on our solar system planets and a chapter on our star, the sun. But yeah, in a blog coming out in late May, I talk about this unique transfer of angular momentum and refractory elements. And that's what's unique about our, our rocky planets. And that's what's unique about our star, the sun. By the way, the search is still going on to find a perfect solar twin of the sun, but we've been looking for 65 years and have yet to come up with one. Hugh, it's 12.05. You want to continue with the questions? Yeah, we'll, uh, no, we'll, we'll, we'll save questions. Any questions we get, we'll uh, pick up next time because I do want to get us into our web meeting for those of you that can stay with us. Uh, we'll have a few minutes where we can all turn on our cameras and our microphones and engage one another. And by the way, uh, there's an increasing number of new people that are coming in here that I've never met. And I think this is a great opportunity to get to know one another. And one of the things we did long before the pandemic is encourage each of you uh, to be able to give a short testimony. 
And uh, what we've been doing in past uh, web meetings, as opposed to this webinar, is uh, you know, you meet a stranger, they ask who you are, they want to know how you became a Christian. Can you give your testimony in one minute or less? Uh, or uh, you get to the point of, okay, uh, how do I know uh, that I'm going to have life after death? How do I know uh, that uh, you know, God can raise somebody from the dead? How can I be confident that I'll have an afterlife and I'll have an afterlife with God and without God? And you got one minute to answer that question because you're in an airport, you're in a bank line. Uh, all you got is one minute. How do you pull that off? So I'm going to give uh, those of you who join us in the web meeting that option uh, to give us. And by the way, it's a great way for us to get to know one another too. So that's what we're going to be doing in the web meeting. And what I'm going to do is uh, share screen again so that those of you who are new will get the URL. So uh, let me uh, do that. It's also being posted in the chat. So if you don't see it. Okay, it's posted in the chat. That's great. Thank you. Okay, this is the URL you're going to need to get into the web meeting. And uh, when you get into the web meeting, give me a minute because you'll all be put into a waiting room. And I need to move you from the waiting room into the actual web meeting. But once you're in the meeting, please turn on your camera, please turn on your microphone. There's a great chance to get to know one another, but I also want to use this as a time where we can help equip one another to be ready at any time to give the reasons for the hope within us, but to do it within a short period of time. So often God gives us only a minute to plant a crucial seed in the heart of an individual. If you read the book I wrote, uh, Always Be Ready, I share stories of how God used perfect strangers to plant a seed in my life when I was growing up. And often it was just 10 seconds. That's all I got was 10 seconds. But a lot can happen in just 10 seconds. I'm going to give you a whole minute. So this is the URL you're going to need to get in the web meeting. What I'm going to do now is uh, stop the share feature and uh, we'll uh, close out the meeting and I'll see those of you who want to join us uh, in the uh, web uh, meeting. Here we go. <laughs>